Biology is often considered a relatively unmathematical science. Compared to the hard sciences of physics and chemistry, biology appears more qualitative and can even be lumped in with the soft sciences of psychology and sociology. And at first glance, the everyday practices of biologists seem to validate this view. Botanists categorise newly discovered plants into species, paleontologists match up new fossils to ancient dinosaurs, biochemists identify what the 3D structure of proteins look like, and neuroscientists label parts of the brain. But is this really a fair assessment of biology? And if so, then what makes physics a hard science and biology a soft science? One answer that comes to mind is the use of mathematics in physics and its apparent absence in biology. All physics students must learn copious amounts of mathematics, whilst most biologists can get through their undergraduate degree having studied no mathematics at all. However, despite this difference in formal education, mathematical biology is one of the fastest growing fields in science today. In fact, maths has infiltrated almost every subfield of biology. Rather than just categorising dinosaur fossils, paleontologists can use mathematical models to give insight to the past. For instance, this model of a T-Rex led scientists to conclude that it was actually not a fast runner, despite what we might think from Jurassic Park. The rise of computational power in the past decade has also had a huge impact on biology. An artificial intelligence called AlphaFold, constructed by Google, is coming close to solving the protein folding problem. That is, computation and mathematics are now central tools in constructing the 3D structure of proteins from their amino acid sequences. And although neuroscientists still do have a lot of work to do in categorising what each part of the brain does, there is also plenty of mathematics in neuroscience. For instance, the Hodgkin-Huxley model, which describes the firing of brain cells, was considered one of the greatest achievements of 20th century biophysics. And they also received the 1963 Nobel Prize for their work. And of course, the use of modelling throughout this pandemic has made it abundantly clear that mathematics and biology can play together very happily. This still leaves something to be wanted. It still feels like the laws of physics seem to be better than this mathematics that we see in biology. To see why, we can use two criteria. The first is predictive power. How well does this equation tell us about the future? And the second is stability. How many assumptions do we need to make for this equation to work? For a case study, let's look at one of the most famous equations in physics. Newton's second law. It states that the force acting upon an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. Or in other words, if you tell me the current position and velocity of an object and all the forces acting upon it, I can tell you where it will be in a few moments time. Say 480 milliseconds or 0.48 seconds. So Newton's second law has extremely good predictive power, so long as we know the initial conditions accurately. Though it does break down when objects start traveling close to the speed of light, all get really tiny. That said, Newton's laws were good enough to get us to the moon and back with the help of people like Katherine Johnston to do the mathematics. This means that Newton's second law is also very stable. We don't need to make that many assumptions at all for it to work. And for a comparison to biology, let's look at the central equations that are used to model predator and prey populations. Let's say we wanted to track the population sizes of a particular species of fish and a particular species of shark. We'll call f the number of fish and s the number of sharks. So in this case, f equals 10 and s equals 2. We now want to track how each of these populations changes over time. That is, we want to know the growth rate of fish and the growth rate of sharks. We'll start by assuming that the growth rate of fish is exactly equal to the number of fish at a particular time. So in the first year, if we have two fish, the growth rate will be two fish per year meaning that we get an additional two fish in the second year for a total of four fish. Our growth rate is now equal to four because we have four fish. And so in the third year, we get an additional four fish for a total of eight. This process then continues and we get a population doubling effect. So 16 in the next year, then 32, then 64 and so on. Exponential growth is a nice starting point, but it's pretty unrealistic since the ocean could only support so many fish. It's not like there's just infinite fish food floating around out there. But rather than fixing this directly, the model just adds in some predators to stop the fish population from growing out of control. To do this, we'll need to subtract off something from the growth rate. And a logical thing to do would be to subtract s, the number of sharks. But we need to be careful because predation is not just proportional to the number of sharks present. It also depends on the number of fish present. This is because with fewer fish around, it becomes less likely for one individual shark to come into contact with a fish, hence less predation. So what we actually need to subtract is f times s. So this leaves us with the growth rate for fish of f minus fs. Now for the sharks, we can start to model their growth rate using the predation term from before, because with more predation, we're obviously going to get more sharks. But now we need to subtract off something different, because with more sharks around, there's going to be less food for each individual shark. 
If there's only one shark present, he gets to eat all the food, whilst if there are three sharks present, they have to split the food amongst them. So with more sharing, there is an increased likelihood of more starvation and some sharks might die off because of competition. Modeling the competition between sharks is quite straightforward since we can just subtract S from their growth rate. More sharks in the ecosystem leads to a lower growth rate because of food sharing. Finally, one more thing we might want to do, which is common in applied mathematics, is to add constants to the front of each term. This allows us to turn up the dials on either reproduction or predation, depending upon the situation. Plugging in some numbers for A, B, C and D, we can visualise what solutions to these equations, known as the Lotka-Volterra model, look like. With these particular choices for our constants, we start off with lots of fish and hardly any sharks, so the fish population can expand. But as they do this, they unknowingly create more food for sharks, so the number of sharks also begins to rise. The sharks then eat the fish, reducing their numbers back down, but this also reduces the shark's own food supply, because now we have many more sharks to feed compared to the start. So sharks begin to starve and we end up back where we started. The model therefore gives these nice cyclical patterns between predator and prey populations. Qualitatively, there are many similarities between Lotka Volterra and real world population dynamics. But this doesn't mean that Lotka Volterra is going to exactly predict how population dynamics evolve. It's, as they say, just a model. If we take another modeling example from biology, such as the equations used to model the pandemic, we can see this in action. For an example, let's take the modeling done by the Burnett Institute in my home city of Melbourne, Australia. In this case, epidemiologists gave their best guess at what the future of the pandemic might look like given the information in mid-September 2021. But as you can see, there are huge error bars above the average here, highlighting that there is plenty of variability in the model. If we overlay the actual case numbers on top of the graph, we can see that the modelling wasn't actually too bad, and it certainly helped in managing the pandemic back in September. But it obviously wasn't perfect. For one, the recent spike in cases due to the Omicron variant was completely unforeseen. This pretty clearly demonstrates the limited predictive power of mathematical models, and the Burnett Institute admits this front and centre on their website. Models make simplifying assumptions to approximate the real world, particularly where data are not available. Some of these assumptions may lead to the model projections being optimistic or pessimistic compared to what may actually occur. Lotka Volterra also makes some incredibly unrealistic assumptions, like infinite food for fish and ignoring all other species in the ecosystem except for the two we care about. In reality, it's much more likely that there would be a complex web of predator and prey interactions, which would severely complicate things. We can expand the model to fix these problems and fit particular real-world situations, but this is largely context-dependent and depends on what exactly we want to fix. And we never had to do anything like this for Newton's laws. F equals MA works just as well here as it does on Jupiter. What we've discovered is one of the central trade-offs for modelers in science. If we want to get more predictability out of a particular set of equations, we usually have to make more assumptions and restrict how widely the equations can be applied. On the other hand, if we want to make our equations more general, we usually have to sacrifice predictive power. Rarely can we get both, especially in biology, hence the lack of laws. This doesn't look too good for biology, but what do these case studies really tell us about equations in science? Well, what we can see is the existence of a spectrum from equations that more closely resemble modelling to equations that are closer to broader theory. On the modelling side in biology, we have things like Lotka Volterra, pandemic models, and the field of population genetics. And on the physics side, we have pretty much everything that's found in applied physics, like equations used to build bridges in engineering, models of a pendulum, and the system of epicycles used in Ptolemaic astronomy. There are also plenty of theoretical equations in physics, such as those found in classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, and general relativity. But in biology, there are no real equivalent equations on this side of the spectrum. Some biologists will argue that equations like Hamilton's rule come close to being law-like representations of life. But there's still plenty of debate around all such equations, which we'll have to talk about in a future video. Up until now, mathematical biologists just tend to work in the modelling side of the spectrum. And mathematics and biology tends to be highly, highly specific. We certainly have no F equals MA. Well, perhaps there is one universal law, as Ernst Mayer said, that all biological laws have exceptions. So to answer the question in the video title, are mathematics and biology mortal enemies? Well, no, there's plenty of mathematics and biology, just that we haven't found broad reaching, predictive and stable laws like in physics. Writer Carl Zimmer summarizes the current state of biology very nicely in his new book, Life's Edge. We don't know when a theory of life might arrive, but we can hope that our lives last long enough to see it.